like a graphic. I need to yeah you should be able to mute it in your screen there's a there's a mute button if you don't if you can't find it I can mute you but... I'm not seeing Like I need to step a, a step away for a moment. I uh, would like you to mute me while that happens. Oh yeah. So you see okay. me come back on camera. All right. Yep. No problem at all. Like that. I've got about a minute left. For those of you who are still on right now, it looks like we've still got everybody on. I need to get my guest back on, so hang with me for just a second. I don't know what the, what exactly happened here, but um, we, I lost a connection, so we're back on. Stay with me. I'm going to get Webb on, and we'll, we'll be right back. Make sure today that you leave this place knowing that you are saved to the glory of God. Thanks. That one I'm going to choose. If you believe that, friends, you don't know the gospel. Is that the wonder of the cross is that no one gets injustice. If you, if you end up under the wrath of God, it is because you've rejected his provision for you and you are justly punished for your sin. I think to what the scriptures teach. I think the Bible does teach that God desires the salvation of all men. He has provided uh, for uh, the, the salvation of all men. And therefore, anyone who, who ends up under the wrath of God, it is because they have rejected his provision for them. 
and they are justly punished for their sins. The question that seeks to provide an answer to this question, for whose sins did Jesus die? The extent of the atonement asks the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? There are only two answers, two possible answers to that question. Either Jesus died for the sins of some people, or Jesus died for the sins of all people. All right, so uh, I got Webb joining with us again uh, right now, so I'm going to get his connection in and cut over to our interview scene, but for those of you who are viewing live today, we're talking about new creation, specifically fire and new creation, and how that's related to the end times. Uh, so we're going to get into some interesting points, some interesting sub-topics and conversations that's going to deal with uh, um, it's kind of a second chance. One, one idea would be a second chance after death. Another idea would be the resurrection of the lost or the resurrection of the unjust. Is there a resurrection for the unjust? And finally, and finally uh, the last point that we're going to be looking at is uh, a question that's pretty... A question that's pretty um, common in in the end times conversation of eternal conscious torment versus annihilationism. So, uh, my guest today is going to be J. Webb Muley. You may have seen it in kind of the advertisement for this post and this live stream. Um, he's written a number of different books, and we'll go over that information for you to be able to contact him and to get in contact with some of the stuff that he's he's written, and uh, go from there. But Anyways, uh, Webb, it's good to have you on the podcast. Welcome to Talking Christianity. Glad to be here. It's good. I, so we've started out a little rough. I've never had that happen before, but for whatever reason, I lost a connection. And I, it, it <laughs> my the whole internet in my house went out. So now it's back on. It actually oh. picked up the stream where it was at. Um, so that's fine. Thank you guys for hanging on that's tuning in live right now. Um, but it, it's good so far, but here's kind of what to expect for this episode. Um, so Webb is going to go through a presentation on new creation, and I'm going to play the slideshow for you all who are watching while he goes through it. We're going to kind of interact with it as we go, uh, between the two of us. Then at the end, I want to open it up to you in the audience. You'll be able to ask your questions, whether it's on, uh, whether it's over the a phone call. Or if you want to actually join the live stream in a video chat, you can do that as well. There should be a link on the Facebook page. There should be a link in the YouTube description if you would like to hit that link and join the live stream to do that as well. So Webb's been willing to interact with the audience at the end. Uh, and that's I think it's going to be a good time. We've got a lot of questions that uh, you know people you really don't see a whole lot of conversation about as, it, as it's related to a second chance after death, as it's, you do see a lot on annihilationism versus eternal conscious torment today, but um, the other aspect is going to be the resurrection. Is there a resurrection for the unjust? So I think all three of those those topics are related to new creation, which you've spent a lot of time on. Um, but yeah, if you would, Webb, just kind of let everybody know um, who you are, kind of what you've done, um, and, and how people can get a hold yeah. of you. Okay, uh, if you go to slide two... Uh, my name is Webb Mealy. You might have uh, seen me styled as J. Webb Mealy uh, in, uh, on the Internet. Are you going to display slide two for us? Oh, are you ready for me to do slides? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, give me just a second. I'll cut over here to this scene. I want to get your camera on here with me, so we should be able to have us both. Okay. Got you in there at left. There we go. Okay. Now you all should be able to see this. Okay. So the first point. Slide two. Slide two. Okay. Okay. So I'm uh, author of After the Thousand Years, Resurrection and Judgment in Revelation 20. That was uh, my PhD thesis. I have a PhD from Sheffield University. Uh, world famous for literary approaches to the scriptures. Uh, reviewers of that monograph uh, gave it some pretty high marks. Uh, Revelation commentator John Court called it an exegetical tour de force. 
Revelation commentator John Sweet called it illuminating both in content and method. Now, Gregory Beale, who disagrees with my approach and who thought it was important enough that he should write a full length uh, review article on it, uh, admitted in this article that I was bringing forward a new paradigm, a methodological contribution without precedent, whose strong prima facie arguments provide a basis for his view, which gives us a, a viability that cannot henceforth be ignored by commentators. In fact, the prima facie nature of these two arguments could have the force of shifting the burden of proof to those disagreeing with Mealy's position. We'll see uh, later uh, what those two arguments are. My latest book is called New Creation Millennialism. I just made that available for five bucks or something, even $3 as a, as a uh, Kindle on Amazon. Uh, New Testament scholar uh, Eckhart Schnabel, who's somewhat of an eschatology guy, uh, wrote that it is provocative, meticulous, and indispensable resource for anyone thinking, preaching, and teaching about New Testament prophecy in general and about the millennium in particular. So that's me bragging about myself. Let's see what's on the next slide. Okay, are, are we ready to go forward with the presentation or? I think so. Um, so um, I, I would just kind of preface for those of you who are, are viewing live right now, this, this may seem like something that um, the first time you hear it is when you're, it, at least for me, it's like no resurrection for the unjust, no, uh, maybe a second chance, and annihilationism. These, these seem like they might be kind of fringe, um, but I, I think that at the end of the day, uh, I want to, and I think my listeners should want to, hear the exegetical support for this. It seems like it's something that has received recognition from other scholars, um, and it's, it's worthy of considering uh, so the, the challenge to it um, is going to be something that maybe gives you a new perspective on the end times and new creation, that right. perspective. And, and from, my, from my perspective, that's something that I always look for is, is, is a challenge to the, the perspective that I do have. So all three of those are challenges to the perspectives that I do have, but we do have some things in common like premillennialism, uh, the atonement. I see that those things are related Maybe we'll get a chance to see the connection between the soteriology and the eschatology. Um, but I think for now, we'll uh, just I'm just going to kind of sit back and listen. And if something comes to my mind, um, I'll pop in and say, hey, Webb, what do you think about this? Is, is this right. a challenge to a point that you've just made and kind of go from there? But that'll give you guys at the end as well to be able to interact on, on the call in line or on the live stream itself or, or in the live chat. So with that said, let me I'll get back to the interview scene and uh, should be able to go from okay. there soon. Well, I can um, put to put to rest one of your um, things that sounds fringe. Somehow or another, you got the impression that I am saying that there is no resurrection for the unrepentant. That is a misunderstanding. What I'm saying is, or what all premillennials, that the unrepentant get no resurrection when Jesus comes in glory. They are only resurrected at the end of the millennium. That's a standard premillennialist structure, right? So uh, and somehow or another, you got the impression that I was saying there is no resurrection. Actually, I affirm a resurrection of all the good and the evil, or however you want to put it. Make sense? I see. Yeah, I've got you. Um, I'll have to see if I can pull that up where I got that. I was reading through um, one of the papers that you had sent me. I think it was the... 15 page paper but um I'll, I'll see if i can find the reference and if i do find that reference um i'll i'll chime in and say hey i think this is where i was getting that and see if i can get some clarification right. and go from there it will be probably from comments i made on luke 20 35 where jesus says those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and the resurrection from among the dead I say that what is, as a premillennialist, I say about that verse, he's affirming that only the, the faithful rise to take part in the age to come. Jesus says nothing specific about the resurrection of the unworthy in that thing. But let's go on. Uh, so 
here's a, a what do you call it, a summary of what we're about to do here. Revelation 19 to 21 and the Isaiah Apocalypse, Isaiah Apocalypse is chapters 24 to 27. Revelation commentators have not gotten to grip with the extremely close relationship between these two uh, prophetic sections. And I'm going to demonstrate how they are just just tracking each other intimately as we go along. So let's see the next slide here. I'm going to start with Isaiah and then show in each case, like as we go along section by section in the Isaiah apocalypse, I'm going to show how the book of Revelation tracks it. So the first thing that happens in the Isaiah apocalypse is you get a prophecy of the demise of the earth and of sinful humanity. So it's like the end of the age, the end of humanity and the end of the earth as we know it. So next slide and another click. There we go. So here we're starting. This is the very first verse of the Isaiah Apocalypse. Now the Lord is about to lay waste the earth and make it desolate. He will twist its surface and it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the slave, so with the master, as with the maid, so with the mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, so with the, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly laid waste. Everybody is going to have the same catastrophic experience. It doesn't matter what their social location. Let's have another click. Oh, you got that click. Good. So Revelation says in chapter 6, and the context of that is, in chapter 6, verses uh, 9 yeah, nine and 10, we see the souls of those who are uh, slain because of their testimony to God and their faithfulness to God. And they're crying out saying, how long before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, the inhabitants of the earth, right? See there, Isaiah 24, verse 1, to scatter its inhabitants. John kind of has... Uh, what do you call it? John uses this inhabitants of the earth uh, terminology just as Isaiah does. But so on uh, the first thing we notice that's similar about these two things, right, is that, that you have the jumbling up of the earth, right? That's what those two arrows show. Uh, let's have and then we have the rulers, influential, commanders, rich, powerful, and everyone who encompasses every single social class. Right? Oh, but we're talking now about the unworthy ones, right? Folks, so these are not the saints. The saints are not afraid. They are actually happy when God comes. <laughs> and when Jesus comes, they celebrate. Sinners are unhappy and they want to hide themselves. They're, they know that the earth is writhing back and forth and they're going, well, we'd rather have the rocks fall on it, right? Then uh, face up to God and Christ, who are here as the judges of the living and the dead. So um, another click there. See the bottom of the screen. Is it showing? It, the, yeah. the whole thing's not really showing on your screen. Um, Revelation nineteen seventeen through 18. Is that all there? Right. That's that's all I've got showing up on the screen here. Oh, uh, I want to show. Oh, I see. I've got to scroll a little bit. Okay. All right. So if everyone can see that, that's great. Um, notice that all the social classes are showing in verse 18. Rulers, commanders, influential people, everyone, the free and the slave, weak and powerful. Everybody who is a sinner is going to be in the same boat. What boat? They're going to lose their lives when Jesus comes in glory. This is in Revelation 19, where he comes back on a white horse and ends up slaying everyone who is a sinner. Um, this is a, this is part of a critique of standard uh, historic and uh, we call it dispensational premillennialism. There's no room in the Book of Revelation or in anywhere actually for anyone surviving the transition between this age and the age to come who is not in God's right relationship with God. Sinners all perish. Now, I think of Second Peter 3, which says that the whole earth will be cleansed by fire. Nobody lives through that. That's a problem with standard premillennialism that I'm going to solve in this presentation. So, uh, yeah, that's that, right? I just said all that, so 
Oh, well, I, let's just skip that part and get, carry on. So that's the first part. Of, I mean, that's the first part of the narrative of the end of the world according to the Isaiah apocalypse. Humanity, sinful humanity, perishes, period. And the earth is thrown into chaos. The second thing that happens is that God expels rebellious, angelic, and human beings from the creation and imprisons them together in the abyss for a long time. That's quite interesting. Angelic beings and human beings imprisoned together. You might have thought there was something weird about uh, Matthew 25, verse 41, where people get tossed into the same fiery destruction as the devil, but there, that, he's, that tracks back to Isaiah Apocalypse as well. Let's go to the next uh, slide. This is the very next verse after the material we were just on. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven, the kings of the earth on the earth, and they will be gathered together like prisoners in the pit, which the pit bore in uh, Hebrew, right? Tracks very closely with the word shell. They, they're synonyms, essentially. Uh, it's, it's, the un, it's the realm of the dead imagined as a great pit, which is like a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison, and after many days they will be punished. Now, in Revelation, we see the kings of the earth, right? There and get a, a narrow. The kings of the earth are arranged against the Lamb and his people and his angels, right? And uh, they're all slain, except for the beast, and that's an exception. But we'll talk about the in general. Humanity, uh, unrepentant humanity in general is slain when Jesus comes again. With all the rest is a strong statement, right? And it says, uh, let's uh, bring up another tablet there, right? It says they will be shut up in prison. But in the book of Revelation, uh, Hades, the underworld of the, of the unrepentant dead, right? I mean, let's put it this way. Faithful, people faithful to God and right relationship with God go to heaven in Revelation. But the unrepentant go to Hades, the underworld. And Jesus says, I have the keys to death and Hades. The strong implication of that is that, he, that Hades is a prison and that he can get people out of there. So when he slays them in chapter 19, uh, he's sending them to the prison of Hades. Give us another click there. Oh, you got that? Right. Yeah. So uh, related, related to this, we have uh, being killed by the sword and the plague and all that in Revelation 6. We have the fourth horseman come along and uh, he's killing people. And... Uh, Hades is coming along behind him to collect all the people because he's the prison warden of the underworld. Hey, so give me just a hey, Webb, just, a, just one second. I, so, Stacy, I see that you're trying to join in right now. Uh, we're going to go through the presentation. It should take about 30, 35 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So uh, if you could just hang on, and when we get to the end, we'll open it up to the audience, and you can join the live stream, and we'll get your questions. And then uh, if you can't make it till then, just type your question into the live chat and I'll be sure and try to get yours first. But if you wanted to, uh, if, if you could, if you could wait, uh, probably 20 minutes or so, we'll get to you. I promise. So, anyways, I'm sorry about that, Webb, and I'll turn it back to you. I know you were. Okay. You were all, good. There you are. all right. All right. So we have all the unrepentant human beings are slain by Christ and sent to the underworld prison of Hades, right? At, and also, the very next thing that happens in 21 to 3 is that the devil is captured, right? You see that? And he is thrown in the abyss, and it's closed and sealed over him. Now, he's not only just thrown in the abyss, which corresponds to the imprisonment of the host of heaven on, on high in Isaiah, right? But he's also, if you see there, he says, uh, this angel had a key to the abyss in his hand and a huge chain. He grabbed the De uh, dragon who is the devil and chained him up and then he threw him into the abyss and sealed it over him so in other words the devil does not get to play havoc down even in the in the underworld he is helpless down there so um let's see here we've got two purple arrows right yep corresponding to in isaiah 24 22 
The rest of the dead, including those slain by Christ that is coming, did not come to life until the thousand years were over, which is to say they are imprisoned in Hades until that time. So we have after many days they were punished. They did not come out of the prison of Hades until a thousand years later. That's a long time, right? And can't come out until the thousand years are over either. But it also says after that he has to be free, set free for a while. So the unrest, sorry, the rest of the dead are, it says they did not come up to life until the thousand years were over. So they are slated to be released and he is slated to be released. Let's look at the relationship between how those two things are expressed by John. Oops, I'm ahead of myself. Let's start. Um, go ahead and go to uh, the slide that says three on it. There we go. So the next thing that happens, we'll talk about that, um, what I was just saying in a moment. So the next thing that happens in Isaiah is, okay, so everyone, all the evil characters, heavenly and earthly, are sent to the underworld. And then it says in verse 23 that God is going to come in glory and reign. So he swept all the opponents out. Right? So let's go to the next slide here. There's Isaiah 24, 23. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before his elders he will manifest his glory. A few uh, verses later it says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, and he will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And what, ha what you have in Revelation, you see the new Jerusalem, and the Mount Zion, uh, right? You can get some purple arrows connecting all these things together, right? Uh, you have uh, God is going to wipe tear from, every tear from their eyes, and you also have no more death. So these two things are close, close, close to each other. And lastly, his glory is going to be fully manifested. That's the golden arrow that you can add there, right? Uh, one more. There we go. All right. Now there's an interesting thing going on here in chapter 21. Uh, it says the source of her light, be, referring to the New Jerusalem, right? She is. Uh, well, let me start over again. God is described in chapter four when when. Uh, John first goes to heaven, or gets the vision of being in heaven, right? And he said, the one sitting on the throne was like a diamond. And so the source of her light in uh, Revelation 21:11 is like a precious gem, like a crystal clear diamond. So in other words, Jer God, in relation to the new Jerusalem in the new creation, is the same, that, that relationship is the same as the relationship between God and his throne in chapter 4. And so it's not a coincidence that Jeremiah prophesies that in the new age, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. Let's go to the next slide. So we're just proceeding along in the narrative of the uh, Isaiah Apocalypse. The next thing that you get is Jerusalem under God's protection in his kingdom is absolutely invulnerable to attack. Let's go to the next slide here. Isaiah 26, 1 to 2. On that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We are <laughs> putting everything in. On, uh, we have a strong city. The Lord sets up victory as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates so that the righteous nations that keep faith may enter in. Right? In Revelation 21, we have the, the wall of the New Jerusalem is constructed of diamond. Well, I mean, this is symbolism, right? Uh, the the re, what it was, what the symbolism symbolizes is that God is the protection around the New Jerusalem. Uh, yeah. Oh, you got all that. Okay. So, um, and also the glory of God is uh, full 
the, the full glory of God is investing the new Jerusalem. The sun and the moon are kind of a little bit uh, embarrassed. They had a job to do to light up the day and the night. Now they're asking themselves, what are we doing now? Uh, because God's glory is so bright, we're not needed anymore. All right. Uh, so it says, open the gates in uh, Isaiah 26, 2, and that, that corresponds to its gates will never be shut, and that the right the, the, that the righteous nation shall, the keep faith may enter in corresponds to the fact that John says in 27, verse 27 of chapter 21, that nothing unholy or anything bad uh, is going to enter the New Jerusalem, only those Lamb's book of life. That is the righteous nation that keeps faith with God through Christ. So we're still tracking super close between John and Isaiah. Go to the next slide. So, having laid that foundation to say, I, I, I feel like I've demonstrated that Isaiah's apocalypse and John are super, super close. Now, there's two ways of looking at that. Either you understand that God's consistent in revealing things. So if he reveals something to Isaiah, why wouldn't it be really close to what he uh, reveals to John? That's fair enough. But there's another side to it, and that is that John, as when something's revealed to him, he recognizes that what he is seeing, or what is being revealed to him, is something that God already had revealed to Isaiah. He obviously knows Isaiah like the back of his hand. So his way of telling his readers when he recognizes the close relationship between what he is and what Isaiah saw was to use these uh, verbal, strong verbal illusions. Not just one or two, but very often three, four, or five in the same passage. So you know you're on the same page. All right, so I'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to be depending on that relationship. We're going to step out of the, you know, uh, chronological order right now because uh, we're going to talk about the millennium. But be forewarned, I'm going to assume they are talking about the same things here. So, uh, next slide. In uh, Revelation 23, John says that the devil is in prison until the thousand years are ended. In Greek, that's Two verses later, a few seconds later, he says, and the rest of the dead remained in prison in Hades. Well, he doesn't say it in those words. He says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were entered. Exactly the same five-word phrase. It is unmistakable that what he's saying is that when G when <laughs> When Jesus comes in glory, the devil is going to be imprisoned in the underworld, and so are all the unrepentant human beings. But when the devil is released, so will they. They're imprisoned together. They will be released together for the final judgment after the thousand years. And this is exactly what Isaiah 22, 24, 22 prophesied. So let's go uh, to the next slide and see what we got. So this is Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years are ended, and that's the same phrase, except it's when rather than until, right? Otherwise, it's word for word the same. We know we're being told. This is the thing that we, that we were just told, and the unrepentant were going to be, or the, those who missed the first resurrection because they were unworthy of it, are going to be released at the same time from the underworld. Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints from the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the pool of fire. Isaiah 26, 9 to 11. You see, we got the last thing we got to in the Isaiah apocalypse section by section was the holy city and mount zion is utterly impregnable because god is its protector right and this comes along next in isaiah when your judgments are in the earth the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness 
If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Because, that is strange, because the glory of the Lord is so bright, it's brighter than the sun, but they cannot see it. All right? Because they are blinded by their own wickedness. O oh Lord, your hand is lifted up, but they do not see it. Lift, a hand lifted up means you're about to get struck. Right? Let them see your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let fire, the fire for your adversaries, consume them. Right? I don't put any arrows here because it's starting, you're getting the idea that I'm bolding and then making the same color for things that are very close. So Isaiah 26, 9 to 11 depicts the judgment that befalls those who had been in prison together for many days when they, by God's grace, the favor shown to the wicked, are released from their long imprisonment. I conclude that because I've understood from John, I'm sort of like, it's between John and Isaiah, I'm getting this sense that this is the resurrection and final judgment and final demise of the unrepentant. What's next here? Uh, yeah, a quick one more. So a few verses later, we have a similar scene in Isaiah, uh, in the Isaiah apocalypse. Right? Verses 20 to 21, it says, Come, my people, enter into your chambers. A cham chambers means your inner room. Okay? You can't look out the window if you're in the chamber. Shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the wrath is passed. For the Lord comes out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will disclose the blood shed on it and will no longer cover its flame. The verb here for punish is the same verb that we had in Isaiah 24, verse 22, saying that after many days they will be punished. Okay? And so here's Isaiah 66. Similar, right? In the context of the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth, right? Isaiah 65 and 66 are all about the new Jerusalem and the, uh, and the new creation. He says, and they will go forth, or they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. Their worm will not die. Their fire will not be quenched. They will be loathsome to all humankind. Usually, when people are killed, Somebody comes and digs a hole and buries them so they're not on the surface of the ground. In both Isaiah 26 and Isaiah 66, people are killed and in Isaiah, uh, and they're on the surface of the ground. But in Isaiah 66, fire and worms clean up the corpses. This has nothing to do with torture or torment or any such thing. They are dead bodies that have uh, been slain by God. Because why? I mean, the standard sort of trope in Old Testament last judgment of the wicked is that they try to make an attack on the holy city. That's all about in all of these passages. And the result is they are consumed instantly by fire from heaven. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I keep asserting that what we're looking at here is the resurrection of the rest of the dead or the unrepentant. And I want to explain one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why that is sustainable. This is uh, an illustration of the kind of ancient Hebrew cosmology with the, the expanse above the sky that separates God's realm from the realm under the, under the heavens. And you got the earth, and then under the earth is the underworld where the dead are. Right? So, it says in Revelation 20, verse 9, real quick, they came up, Gog and Magog came up onto the broad plain of the earth. Now, <laughs> you can't come up onto a plain unless you're underneath it. See what I'm saying? This is one of the two prima facie arguments that Gregory Beale, in his review article of After the Thousand Years, said it's so strong, it tends to shift the burden of proof on people who don't want to say that that's what's going on. 
the reason why they can come up onto the broad plane of the Earth is because they're underneath it, in the underworld. We just got, we know that that's the case from the cosmology of Revelation, right? The beast who was slain, you remember the beast who was slain? It says he comes up out of the abyss and goes to destruction. So to be slain is to go into the abyss. Uh, and the devil's in the book. We'll not pound on that too much. The other, so this is the one of the two prima facie arguments as Beale characteristics. Could you go back again? Um, the, the other prima facie argument is the fact that Paul, uh, uh, John uses the same five word Greek phrase for when the devil gets out from his imprisonment and when the rest of the dead get out of their imprisonment by resurrection. So when you add these two together and you add it to a concordant reading with Isaiah, the Ap Isaiah apocalypse, you've got a strong picture of what's going on here. Uh, next slide, Phil. In Isaiah, uh, sorry, uh, in uh, Revelation 29, it says, from heaven and consume them. That is Gog and Magog, the human ones, right? But then it says that, and the devil, another click, was thrown in the pool of fire. Now, the trick about this is that the devil is not earthbound, right? So, I mean, if fire comes, he could somehow get away, right? But no, he was he was thrown into the same fire that came down and inundated the uh, and inundated and consumed those who those the resurrected unrepentant who tried to surround and uh, besiege the faithful in the beloved city. Verse eight. Another click. Now people think of the lake of fire and they think it's some sort of big permanent feature. That's not actually what John's getting at. The Greek word limne is the first definition in uh, Little Scott Jones, which is the standard reference lexicon of ancient Greek, is this, a pool of standing water left by a sea, the sea or a river. So the tide comes in, tide goes out, and there's some pools of water left. That's a limne. The river overflows because it's uh, too much rain, and when it goes back to its normal banks, you see some pools of water sitting around. That is what, to the imagination of, to a, of an ancient Greek speaker, uh, you get if you're talking. So the devil is thrown into the pool of fire that is created by this river of fire that comes down and hits the ground. Uh, right? That's the imagery of it. It's not a permanent feature of, and, and what's the word for it? It's not a permanent feature of, uh, of a new creation or anything else. So Daniel 7 has this, the ancient days to the seat, the throne was flaming, and a river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. Now, guess what happens when, when that river of fire comes out before him? It incinerates the fourth beast. And that's exactly what we saw in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. I'm, I've gone into that right now, but right? The beast, at, at the appearance of the Son of Man, uh, at Christ's coming in glory, he gets instantly incinerated in the, uh, in the uh, pool of fire, from the river of fire that comes from God. So this is all working together. Let's see what we got next after this. Okay, so what is the theological significance of reading the last judgment as revealed by Isaiah? Isaiah 27.1. Next slide. It's a, so we had in uh, 20, Isaiah 26, 20, and 21, that's the one that says, and, uh, go in your inner rooms. I've got some unpleasant uh, work to do, and I don't want you guys to have to... Uh, you know, uh, witness it. Just go inside. I've got some enemies to take care of. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's exciting. I'll get you muted here and uh, stay tuned with everybody else. So you should be good. But okay, guys. So it looks like uh, so far. Yeah, Webb, are you? You're taking a. You're taking a break for a second. Is that right? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I thought I was still working on my presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I, I thought you said you were going to take a break. No worries. Um, yeah, hmm. if, you, if you're ready to keep rolling. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep going. All right. So Let's go to slide 19. It's like Siri, Siri thinking you're talking to her. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's about right. Okay. Now, Isaiah next to Isaiah 26. Verses 20 and 21. Now, they're the immediate previous verses where God says to the folk, uh, you know, go inside. I've got some unpleasant business to do. And be patient. It won't take long. I'm going to wipe out all your enemies is the implication, right? And it says the, the earth will not cover its plain, right? The very next verse is this one here. In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, the viathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, the dragon, if the, if the dragon is one of the hosts of heaven, right, which John would affirm, he would say that the dragon is the devil. You can see that from Revelation 22. He, he intentionally links you to Isaiah 27, uh, 2, by calling him the dragon and the serpent. All right. The dragon was not killed in uh, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3, and there's no indication that the hosts of heaven were killed in uh, Isaiah 24, verses 21 to 23. They were imprisoned. So something else is going to happen to the devil. He's going to be absolutely killed, not just imprisoned. All right, so the next slide. So next, this is the very next verse after that one about the, the Leviathan getting killed, right? In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. And you can see that that uh, connects to Isaiah 5, 7. It's the people, the faithful, who are the vineyard. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone damage it. I protect it night and day. That connects to Isaiah 26, 1 and 2, where God is the protector of Mount Zion and, and the New Jerusalem. Uh, I have no wrath. Will someone bring these thorns and briars to battle? If you do, I will march again and turn them up together. Instead, let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. Now, my comment on this is, this is the same, he's talking about the same moment as when the devil is tossed into the lake of fire. And he's also talking about the same moment when Gog and Magog, who represent the unrepentant human beings resurrected after the thousand years, when they get inundated by fire from heaven. So verse four, he's saying, I've got nothing against you. Right? You paid the price by being denied resurrection for the entire thousand years of the glorious kingdom of the new creation. Uh, you've already been punished, but I am letting you out on parole. And so from my point of view, I'm speaking in God's voice here. Right? Like, I, I have no wrath towards you. But if you bring, if you try to bring things against my vineyard, like weeds and brambles and all this kind of stuff, you're going to get burnt up just like a pile of old tumbleweeds and weeds that go up in a huge whoosh of fire. Right, garden weeds <laughs> burn up completely. Instead, he says, verse five, let them hold, lay hold of my protection. The new Jerusalem has God's protection and you can have it too if you make peace with me. So it is, to me, this is one final plea on God's part to reckon to that the un the unrepentant who are, who are God's enemies in their heart, as Colossians says, for them to make peace. Now, I don't believe that that happens. I believe that it is predestined that they are given this chance by pure grace. Just because God is not going to destroy them and remove them completely from his creation without first giving them every single chance to turn around even this one in resurrection itself. 
Okay, so this is where I would have a question. I think it's uh, this is where it, it's really starting to get interesting because you're coming to you're coming into the millennium, and specifically this this is where you're coming out of the millennium. You're saying that there's no resurrection for the unjust, for the devil, for his angels, um, for the unrepentant in the in the uh, in the millennial reign of Christ. And as a premillennialist, we would say that would. That would be Christ. Christ's return is at the beginning of the millennium. He's sitting on the throne. He's reigning for a thousand years uh, with those who have been resurrected to life at the beginning of the millennium. And you're saying there's there's a resurrection. The first resurrection is going to be those who are resurrected to life at the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and that would include the martyrs of the tribulation period. That would include um, everybody up to that point in history on a linear timeline that if they've if they've lived <clears throat> if they've lived in faith, um, essentially this is the resurrection they're going to take part in. You're saying that the second resurrection is going to be at the end of the millennium, but that they there is some sort of a second chance. Am I understanding that right so far? I am reading the words of Isaiah twenty-seven two to five, as spoken in the voice of God and directed to the resurrected unrepentant. So yes, if you can read Isaiah 27, 2 to 5 as a chance to come under God's protection and to make peace with God, then absolutely. Isaiah tells me so, so I believe it. So you're saying, so I, I guess this is, this, this is a new concept for me, um, specifically from Isaiah 27, 2 through 5, that that you would you're taking the position that Isaiah is taking the position that at the resurrection of the unrepentant unjust at the end of the millennium that they are given a chance because their time has been served their punishment has been paid um, and they're no, no longer under the wrath of God that now they're given a, an opportunity to make peace with God after they've already died they've already they've already been in this this place of torment um, during the millennium, and now they've been resurrected in bodily form, and in this bodily form, they've been given a second chance to make peace with God and have eternal life. Is that is that more so what the point is? Yes. Okay. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, uh, th th there's no indication, I mean, put this way, uh, not everyone who ends up uh, in the underworld ends up with the same amount of discomfort. Uh, Jesus makes it real right. clear in a, a number of different teachings that it, a great deal depends on how merciless you've been to other people, right? Those who have had mercy will find themselves getting off light. But the devil is going to have one last chance to deceive unrepentant humanity when the de when the uh, what do you call it, uh, at, after the 1,000 years are over. Mm. And uh, according to the way I read it, they all fall for it. And it sort of vindicates God's uh, wisdom in not resurrecting them in the first place. Yeah. Kenneth, Joel, I see your comment, or at least some portion of your comment. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This connects to... Uh, John 5. Not everyone is resurrected at the same time. You could get that impression from John 5. But as a premillennialist, there are other considerations that are stronger uh, to me that make me think that the resurrections do not happen at the same time. But everyone yeah. is resurrected by grace, by the power of Christ, who died for all and has the authority to unlock the prison of the underworld and let people out in other words, to bring them out in resurrection. What he does at that time is offer them another chance. How I read Isaiah 25, uh, 27, verses 2 to 5. Um, so I'm with you up to, that, up to that point of the reading of Isaiah um, 27 as it's related to a second chance. I, 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 I think there are two resurrections. I think the timing of the resurrections, I agree with you on I'm not sure that I see in Isaiah 27, 2 through 5, where there would be a second chance 
um, specific, and maybe we'll get to that in the question time, but I do want to have, I, I want you to have the chance to get through the rest of the presentation. Maybe there's some questions that, that I've got right now that, that'll be answered as we get, get along well, in here. Let me answer that right, right away, uh, just briefly, right? Verse 20, uh, verse five here in the green mm -hmm. is God speaking to those who are standing outside his vineyard, which means standing in the presence of the community of the beloved, and they're thinking about attacking it. And he is saying to them, lay hold of my protection. Make peace with me. Make peace with me. God doesn't say things that God does not mean. This is a genuine offer. Now, they don't take yeah. it, but that doesn't mean it's any less genuine. Yeah. Um, so this, it, kind of from my perspective, um, the, the way that I see the w the way that I see this go in one of two ways it, it it could be it could be a reference to those who are in the millennium that are in bodies who it, it is not a as a reference to the resurrection of the unjust um, but to those who have not laid hold of the protection of Christ in their bodily form prior to death but the other the other aspect of it it could be when we're in the context of uh, battle. It could be a reference to the Battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the millennium, where there's there's again kind of a judgment of nations, kind of with a with a line being drawn in the sand that there is there is an opportunity um, for those who are at this battle to choose which side they'll be on. But but um, that's right. just looking at it off the top of my head. I'm not sure. I I don't see right. where there, this would be a, re a reference to the resurrection of the unjust in their resurrected bodily form. Well, you have to read Revelation 1, uh, 20, 1 to 10, concordantly with Isaiah, the Isaiah Apocalypse, to come, and, and according to the clues uh, carefully laid in his text, to understand that Revelation 27 to 10, the Gog and Magog scene, is the resurrection of the unrepentant. It'll take a while for pre uh, historic premillennials to get their head around the idea that no one except for the faithful survives to take part in the age to come. If you just start at Matthew 1, 1 and go to, you know, what, Revelation 19, verse 21, any indication whatsoever that anyone besides the faithful gets to take part in the glorious kingdom that dawns when Jesus comes again. You have to make an exception for that if you read the millennium passage as letting people in. Gog and Magog are not folks that somehow manage to not be a part of the uh, Battle of Armageddon. They are yeah. the rest of the dead. So, so and when if you, they are the rest of the dead. Yeah. So on the, if we're looking on a linear timeline and, we, and we've got the, uh, Satan and the devil and his angels who are locked up in the abyss during the, th the millennial reign of Christ, and they're chained up. At the, at the end of the millennium, you see a reference to the devil being loosed for a short season, and he goes and deceives the nations. Um, do, do you think that that could play a part in uh, the deception of these nations relating back to um, where verse 5 could be a reference, not to those who have entered into the kingdom who have not been faithful, but a reference to those who have been deceived by the, angel, uh, by the devil and his angels at the end of the millennium where he sh he's loosed for a short season. Well, it's not at the end of the millennium, it's after the end of the millennium, okay? After the end of the millennium, the devil is released from the underworld and so are all the rest of the dead besides the faithful. They're all released together and you see them in the scene of Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. And yes, he does deceive them. He and they are all terribly self-deceived. As it says in Isaiah uh, 26, verses 10 to 11, you know, uh, they don't see the majesty of the Lord. Your hand is lifted up, they do not see it. But fire is going to come down and consume them. This is the picture of the last stand of the unrepentant, human and angelic. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess, and, and I won't keep I'll keep you tied up here. I just, for me, I see this as a reference to those 
who haven't had a chance yet that this would be a reference to to those who are that are be actively being deceived by the devil and his angels where he's given a prophecy that they will have the chance to lay hold on his protection and make peace with him and he'll make peace with them but but I don't I just don't see where that's I, and I know you're making a cross reference to Revelation 20 but um, I I think that I, for me it would it would just seem like I'd need a little more to see the distinction between those who are already resurrected versus those who have not died and been resurrected yet. But as of right now, I'd, I'd be more convinced that this is a reference to those who haven't died yet that are in the process of being right. deceived. Well, I can at this point point people uh, to my book, New Creation Millennialism, which shows just how impossible it is uh, to have a model of the millennium in which ordinary mortals are crossing over the boundary between the end of this age and the age to come. Particularly, well, yeah. Hmm. The, the whole earth gets jumbled. And, you know, John and Peter are in agreement that the surface of the earth is completely destroyed and remade when Jesus comes in glory. So nobody can just sort of sneak into the millennium who, like, is not either a faithful one or, well, period, right? Um, but uh, you'll have to read the argument in, in detail to understand how historic premillennialism and, uh, what do you call it, dispensational premillennialism really can't get off the ground when you look at it carefully. And that's why, uh, God, that's one of the reasons why Gog and Magog must be the resurrected unrepentant. Because there's no one else for them to be. No one got to take part in the thousand years besides the faithful ones. Yeah. Well, I, I but do, okay, so do you see uh, procreation taking place in the millennium with uh, people actually producing offspring? No. Oh, you don't? Because only the, only the faithful take part in that age. Is that right? According, I mean, what yeah. I'm saying is only the faithful who are, Jesus calls them the ones who are considered worthy to have a part in that age and the yeah. resurrection from among the dead they do not marry and they are not and they're not given in marriage they're like angels in heaven as regards that yeah all right there's no more pre procreation the full complement of human humanity of faithful humanity has been reached yeah. the whole reason for procreation is to fill the world with people by the end of this age the world will have been filled with people and will god of will have harvested so to speak all the faithful of all history and uh, there's no more uh, role yeah. for procreation at that time. So I think that's probably where I would disagree is uh, the entrance into the millennium. You've got prior to prior to um, the millennium, you would have in Matthew 25, the judgment of nations. And I think from the way that I see it until I'd be convinced otherwise, I think that you do have uh, the just and bodily form without having a, a, a change in their bodily form to a resurrected glorified body that they enter the kingdom in that body and that procreation would go on in that body and they would have offspring so when you see the devil being loosed at the end of the millennium and he's deceiving the nations i think that he's he's literally actually actually deceiving nations of of people who have been procreating and populating those nations that they could be deceived if not I think it's kind of a right. pe peculiar thing that you've got the devil going to deceive nations of, of people in glorified just bodies where it doesn't seem like he would have any effect in that in that area. Well, I didn't say they're glorified just bodies. They are given, they are resurrected, they are given bodily life again. We're not told they're given the same kind of life as the, the holy ones are. And as far as uh, Matthew 25 is concerned, right? It says that the sheep will go into eternal or uh, age-long life. And that eternal life phrase, that is always, always uh, linked with resurrection in the New Testament. You can't um, uh, sort of say, oh, well, they're, they're just given extra-long mortal life. That didn't work, in my view. <laughs> Oh yeah, and okay. Um, I, not to belabor it, I think John ten ten could make a, an argument for a kind of a distinction between 
uh, eternal life and the quality of life. One, it, that you would have life and life more abundantly. So life, life could be a reference to life and, and, and eternal life and that concept that you can take hold of and grasp eternal life. I think anyone who's accepted Christ could say that we've taken hold of eternal life in this life but that we would have life more abundantly would be a quality of life. So I think in that sense, I, it, it might be applicable, but it's not really um, not really much on my side to argue about. But True. Yeah, so, I don't think that's much of a proof text for what you're um, needing. Yeah. But let, let's leave it. Okay. Let's just leave it as, as a kidding. theoretical possibility yeah. that I'm correct that the Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, refers to... The resurrection, judgment, and final instant incineration of the resurrected under him. So I think for those of you who are, are tuning in live, the disagreement that we're having is, as it's related to Isaiah 27, Isaiah 5, and Revelation 20, um, those who enter into the millennial kingdom, uh, Webb is saying that these would be, um, at the end of the millennium rather, these these are these would be the resurrected unjust who are given a second chance to Correct. take hold of the life and eternal life that Jesus Christ would have to offer them. While I would say there this these people who are being deceived and, and are given the chance at life and eternal life would be those who have entered into the millennial kingdom as the offspring of the physical procreation of of people who have accepted Christ at the judgment of nations from Matthew 25. So the difference is, I don't believe they've died yet. He believes they've, they've died and been resurrected. Um, so in, in if you could, Webb, just tell us, it, am I understanding that right? Is that where our difference seems to lie so far? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and my two main arguments in favor of my view is, one, John makes it unmistakable that when the devil is released from prison, so also will the rest of the dead be resurrected. So when he comes out, they come out. So that Gog and Magog scene is recognizable at, uh, according to his literary clues as the resurrection of the rest of the dead. Uh, secondly, he says it's kind of tricky. He, he's describing a standard Old Testament uh, final battle scene, but he, he describes it in a strange way. He says they came up on the broad plain of the earth. Right? right? And that, it sounds like they're coming up from the underworld because you can't get under, you can't come up on the broad plane of the earth unless you're already underneath it. So he's using the standard trope of the final battle, but he's giving us clues that what it means is this is God's final encounter with the unrepentant as resurrected people. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, do you want to keep going? I think we're getting close to uh, the end of the presentation. I think right next we've got fresh light on difficult passages. So, where do you want to go from here? Right. There's just one slide. There's just one slide on that. Um, okay. Let's go past that. And uh, this is Revelation uh, twenty eleven to fifteen. I uh, <laughs> I saw. I, this is a kind of literal, rather literal translation that I've made here. And I saw a great shining throne. The, uh, the word that's translated usually white also can just mean shining, levkos in Greek. Uh, and of course, why, if the throne of God is the New Jerusalem, as I think I've demonstrated, right, by the concordant reading of Isaiah and John, then there's a reason why it's shining. It's because he's shining on it, okay? And on it sat he from whose presence heaven and earth had fled, and no place was found for them. That we saw, how, does, how do we know that heaven and earth fled? We saw that happen in chapter 6, and, we also, and you also saw it in chapter 14. The mountains and the islands flee away and can't be found. It's like the surface of the earth is shaken out like a carpet. Somewhere in the prophets, I can't remember where it is, it talks about that God is going to shine out of the earth. Um, that's what's being talked about here. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and then another book was open, which is the book of life. 
The book of life is the citizen role of the new Jerusalem. And the dead were judged by what was written in the book, according to what they had done. As I understand this, the books contain the records of what people have done in their mortal lives. All right. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the pool of fire. This is the second death, the pool of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, in other words, everyone other than those who were citizens of the new Jerusalem, he was thrown into the pool of fire. This passage, uh, famous Revelation commentator R.H. Charles thought this passage had to be goofed up somehow. He thought some somebody tried to uh, transcribe John's words and got it all fouled up because if you read the the bold parts, the red and the and the black, it appears you have a double description of the judgment. First, there's the, the dead being judged as dead people, written uh, according to their behavior in mortal life, and then the dead after resurrection being judged by their behavior. But According to what I've just been, uh, the, the, the model of what's going on that I've just laid out, this uh, perfectly works. The dead are judged in the gap between this creation and the new creation. And, the, and the, what is, what is the, yeah, the criterion of the judgment is, what did you do in your mortal life to make you either worthy or unworthy of participation in the glorious kingdom and the new creation that is now dawning? And what's the result of uh, being judged unworthy? You're left unresurrected for the entire millennium. But then you are resurrected, and verse 13, you are judged according to your works. Not old works that you were already judged, condemned, and punished for by being denied resurrection, but the works that you do while you're standing there as a resurrected person. And their works are to try to uh, attack the faithful one. And they are thrown into the pool of fire. Right? Pool of fire, being thrown into a pool of fire and being inundated by a river of fire from heaven, is not, no, there's no difference between those two things. They're exactly the same thing. So, and this is the second death. Now, the, the interesting theological result of this is that... Uh, the pool of fire is complete and total and irrevocable incineration by God. And the picture of everlasting torment cannot be taken literally. Or, or let's put it this way. You can't have it both ways. You can't have that people are instantly incinerated and totally consumed by fire on the one hand, and they're also tormented forever in the uh, lake of fire. You have to decide which one you're going to take literally because they can't both be literal at the same time. And what I'm proposing is uh, the uh, the one of instant incineration is the one that is the, is the more literal one, and the other one is hyperbolic. And I can exp I can explain later why uh, John might use this kind of hyperbole and how it works. I see. Okay, that's good. Um, so is that that's the end of the presentation, isn't it? Yep, we'll call that the end of the presentation. Okay, um, so I think this would be the point we're going to get be able to get to questions. Um, and I've got some questions that that I've I can think of myself as we come along through this. But uh, what do you think? Is this a good time to open it to the audience, or do you want to go through some common questions sure. prior to it? Okay. No, we'll, we'll see if uh, the audience hits the questions that I predicted they might ask. That'll work. Sounds good. And if they miss any, then we can go over some of the questions that you thought they might ask and see if we can ask them for them. So, yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, if we have time. Stacy, this would be the time if you would like to, you can uh, join the, the call. And same for, the, uh, same for you others who are tuning in live right now. If you want to join this call, you can and do the live chat with us and ask your question. So... Uh, there should be a link in the description box on YouTube. There should be a link in the description box on Facebook as well.
But if you'd rather call in, uh, you should see that number scrolling across your screen now. You can call in as well at 816-866-0025. Um, and, and we'll leave it up to you. If you want to type in your question, you can do that as well in, in the live chat. So you've got a number of different options to engage with us if you would like to. Um, so right now we've just got seven people who are tuning in for the live stream. So, and that's not, that's not a problem. That's mostly my fault because, uh, at the beginning of, of the, of the live stream, uh, we started off with a, about 20 in the first, you know, probably minute or two. And it was going up on who was going to be tuning in, but I lost internet service. I really can't tell you what happened, um, but we'll leave it at that. So here's the first question that I've got, and, and I think uh, it's it's kind of something that I'm grappling with as, as you're talking about those who are given a second chance. So you are saying that the resurrection of the unrepentant unjust is the same resurrection. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So the res and it takes place at the end of the millennium, before after, the death. After the thousand years. Yeah. So after the thousand years, at the end of the millennium, before the devil and his angels are released from the bottomless pit, if you want to call it that. No, not before. They are released at the same time, yeah. just as Isaiah twenty four twenty two says, and so, just as John indicates. So they're 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 released at the same time. And you're saying that the population of people during the millennial reign of Christ is all, um, they're all people that are in new bodies. Is, is that what you're, Correct. is that what you're saying? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, they, so they've and that's all, what, think of Luke twenty thirty five. those who are considered worthy to, of a part in that age and the resurrection from among the dead, right? Those. Anyone who is considered worthy of a part in that age is a participant in the resurrection. And it's the resurrection from among the dead in the sense that not all the, not all the dead are raised at that time. Only those who are considered worthy. There is a judgment at Christ's coming in glory, and that ju judgment determines who is going to take part in the wonderful, glorious kingdom of God that is now uh, dawning in its full uh, glory okay and um and you're saying now let me get this straight I want, i'm trying to post this link in there if anybody wants to join the join the live stream okay so you're saying um everybody in the millennium they're all in a glory is it a glorified body what, what sort of body are they in sure sure okay so everybody's in a glorified body and they are all they've all been resurrected or has everybody at the judgment of nations you've got the the sheep and the goats the division of 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 followers of Christ versus those who are rejecting Christ and in Matthew 25 you see that illustrated but I I think what if I'm understanding you you're right if they are in a resurrected glorified body they they would have all already had to have died so is there anybody who enters into the millennium who's who's alive and has not died yet? Yes. And okay. Paul says, I tell you a mystery, that we will not all sleep. Uh, so the whole idea of the resurrection uh, kind of leaves un, unspecified. Well, what happens to people who uh, actually live and survive on the earth to that actual moment? There's nothing in the Old Testament that uh, says that specifically right? you don't get a rapture thing. and so Paul says that both in 1 Corinthians 15 and in 1 Thessalonians 5 he basically says if we actually those of us who survive to that moment will be trans transformed into the a re a resurrection equivalent state we will be on the same footing as the folks who are being brought uh, brought to life from the dead. That's Paul's uh, explanation of, but that's the only people who are alive at Christ's coming in glory who enter the age to come. The Christian, uh, Christians who have died in faithfulness and Christians who have been living up to that moment in faithfulness. No non-Christian person survives that moment. 
Okay, so you're saying that even in that second category of Christians would be Christians who have not died that are that are, that were faithful and, and have in, entered into the presence of the kingdom with Christ. Um, why do you say that they are not procreating during this time? Because Jesus teaches me that. I just got done saying that a couple of times now. In Luke 20, verse 35 and 36, he says, those who are considered... <laughs> Well, I see what you're saying now. Let me just think about this. Those who are uh, accounted worthy of a part in that age and the resurrection from among the dead, marry nor are given, uh, given in marriage. I can see how if you wanted to try to push it, you could say, well, that's only the resurrected folks, folks who are, you know, transformed into a resurrected resurrection equivalent form, uh, they'll be able to procreate. I don't believe that's what's going on because of the larger eschatological story. Yeah. The larger eschatological story is that humanity, there's a total predestined number of people that God is going to bring into mortal life on this earth, and they are the community, uh, the everlasting community. And when that number is finished, there's no more, there's no further role for procreation. Okay, so, but they're in physical bodies, just like, uh, just like bodies that we've got now. They haven't been transformed yet um, for that second category. Then you've got the category of those who have been what? resurrected. No, I don't agree with that. I don't okay. agree with that. So they you're are transformed so into resurrection equivalent, oh. right? It says those of us who are left alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, yeah. right? And so we shall also always be with the Lord. And Revelation, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, in an instant, we will take on the same incorruptibility as the, those who are resurrected. 1 yeah. Corinthians 15 doesn't leave a distinction uh, so that people have less than the full glorification and resurrected power body or whatever you want to call it, just because they live to see Christ yeah. coming. So I guess my question would be, uh, now this is going to dive into a whole other area of, of eschatology, is um, it seems like, it, or, or, I'll just ask, do you believe that there's, you, you made a reference to 1 Thessalonians 4 and uh, a, a reference for the rapture. Do you believe that it's a pre-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture? No. Oh, sorry. I, I, I anticipated I believe that there is not a thing in the scriptures to support the idea of pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, so so it, you would say it's a post-tribulation rapture. That's what Paul's talking about. That's un, unmistakable if you look at it carefully. Okay, so this would be that would be a point of contention. So I would have to I would have to take um, the post-tribulation rapture position in order to hold the view that you don't have anyone entering the kingdom um, in, a phys in a physical body where there's a, even a, a possibility of procreation. So um, I can see why you would take that position, I, which that would be, I, I guess that'd be the place to start. But okay, so now we were looking at, in, in Revelation 20, this is kind of switching gears here, and in your mm -hmm. book you were talking about, you were talking about kind of a recapitulation uh, in Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, specifically, you're, you, you're saying that there's either two categories or it's a recapitulation of one category of people. And what you have, what you have brought up seems to be challenging those who have read over uh, Revelation 20 in the past and, and not seen it from this perspective. So, and for me personally, when I, when I first read what you had written there, and maybe I'm not uh, maybe I'm not vocalizing it the way that it, it was written. Maybe I'm not understanding it the way that you, you intended it. Um, but it seems like what you're saying is that that there's one category uh, of people that's written in verse 13, the sea giving up their dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And you're saying that it seems like there's, there's two categories here um, where there's... There's the sea giving up the dead, and death and hell delivering up the dead, and then there's a judgment. So, can you kind of recap what what the argument that you're making is out of these two verses, and then we can go forward. Okay. 
Right. Well, let's go back to slide 22. Or, or uh, let's just have people look on in their Bibles or whatever at Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. Revelation 20, 11 and 12 create a picture that God comes in glory and the entire creation dissolves. Right? Heaven and earth flee away. And then, so what that means, if heaven is fleet away, and earth is fleet away, but the underworld, right? Uh, and so the dead are standing there in the underworld with the lid taken off. And so the dead are judged, verse 12, by what was written in the book, according to what they had done. They had, according to what they'd done when, and what they had done in their mortal lives before they died to send them to the underworld. Okay. And then verse 13, the sea gave up the dead, death and Hades gave up the dead, and they were judged according to what they had done. So in other words, first they are judged in the underworld according to what they had done in immortal lives, and then they are drawn out of the underworld, and they are judged according to what they do as resurrected people. Now this is all very com compact, right? But it does, when I say recapitulation, uh, verses 12 and 13 recapitulate chapter 20, verse 4 uh, to 10. First, there's a judgment of people according to their works in mortal life, and some are found unworthy of taking part in the resurrection that's called the first resurrection. They are, uh, the sentence for them is they are left dead. Uh, they, they are not raised until the thousand years are completed. Now, that's a serious punishment. The glory of the kingdom and the banquet that is coming, right? They miss a whole thousand years of the new creation. Uh, but after that, they are raised and they are judged for how they behave as resurrected people. So you either have, I'm so here's the two. Yeah. You were talking about two choices. The two choices are either John's kind of convoluted and he's stating the same judgment twice in verses 12 and 13 there, or uh, he's actually recapitulating, uh, doing again, uh, picturing again or seeing another version of uh, what we saw in Revelation 20 verses 4 to 10. Now, if you could go... If you, if you get to my slideshow and uh, and go to uh, go to slide twenty four, mm, I don't see the numbering on these slides, so you'll have to tell me when oh, to get well, there. But how you do it is you just type two four and enter, and it will take you to slide twenty four. I see. Oh, there we go. Okay, now Revelation twenty seven to ten. And got and uh, Revelation twenty and eleven fifteen. Click on that one, and that is the question. If Revelation twenty seven to ten and eleven to fifteen are so different, how can you say they depend depict the same last judgment? Next slide. So here's the basic layout, right? You got the second coming, Revelation nineteen eleven to twenty one, then the thousand years the millennial priestly reign of the Holy Ones with Christ, right? And then after that, the ages of the ages. You have in King James, it's called forever and ever, but actually, literally, it's to the ages of the ages. Now, if you click once there, the, ba the last battle as a judgment scene, well, sorry, let me start again. The last judgment of the unrepentant as a battle scene is Satan's hordes surround and attack the holy city and are consumed by annihilating fire. The last judgment is then presented as a courtroom scene. All the unrepentant judged by their deeds are thrown into the pool of fire, the second death. Um, so how can that both be the same thing? Give me a click and you'll see a stereoscope. You ever seen one of those things? I have, I don't yeah. know if they use them in. Right? This is what is being revealed here is so deep that it can't be 
fully revealed in one kind of imagery. It's two things at the same time. It's a battle and it's a judgment scene at the same time. The same event is viewable or understandable both in both these terms. Now that may seem far-fetched, but have a look, uh, click again. Let's see if we can get the policy of Christ. All right, here I can show you a precedent for this double battle and, and courtroom scene pattern a few verses away. So in Christ coming at, in uh, 1911 to 21, he comes back as, as a warrior doing battle to take over the earth, right? And then in Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6, the same is the same moment in eschatological history is seen as uh, a courtroom scene where the dead are judged and only the faithful are chosen to live and reign with Christ. So Revelation, if you click it one more time there, Revelation has, whoops, what happened there? Let's go back. Oh, yeah, I want to talk about Revelation 17. Um, it's clear from Re Revelation itself that this is something that God sometimes does. He reveals two different angles on the same thing. And Revelation 11, verses 7 to 18, uh, show that that the what what is a judge sort of a, a courtroom judge judgment scene on the one hand can also at the same very same time be a battle. So it says you've taken your great power and have begun to rule. The nations were angry and your wrath came. The time to judge the dead and to give rewards to your servants, the prophets, and to the holy ones and to those who revere your name, and the weak and the powerful, and to destroy those who are destroying the earth. When Christ comes in glory, it will be both, at the same time, a judgment, uh, a kind of a courtroom, uh, you know, the king, uh, like, sort of like Matthew 25, uh, 31 to 46, right? It's both at the same time. So that's that. Um, so That's are you why, uh, oh, so, go on. Are you saying that Revelation 11 and Revelation 20 as the parousia the second coming of Christ um would be the same battle and the same judgment? Uh Revelation 11 17 to 18 is the same thing as Revelation 19 11 to 21 Jesus Christ coming back uh on a white horse with all his faithful ones to uh, boot out from the earth all unworthy inhabitants of the world. Yeah. But it's also at the same time, that same parousia event, right, is also the moment at which God chooses some for resurrection uh, and chooses others to stay dead or get dead. I see. Um, okay, so, so um, do you see a difference between... Uh, the judgment of nations in Matthew 25 and the the parousia um, at the return of Christ versus a judgment of of nations at the end of after the millennium is over and the devil's been loosed for a short season to deceive those nations. Do you see those as being different? Uh, y yes. Uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46 is a parousia scene. It is not end of the millennium scene. Right. I can, uh, I wonder where, let's see here. I don't have it here, I don't think, in my PowerPoint presentation. But Isaiah, I'll, I'll just do it by memory, right? Matthew 25, 31 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on, no, when the man, Son of Man comes, he will sit on his glorious throne, right? That is an allusion to Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23. The Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion before its elders gloriously, right? The glorious coming of the king is not only God the Father King, but is also Christ the King. 
Christ and the Father both come in glory. Christ and the Father both come as judge of the living and the dead in the book of Revelation and elsewhere in the New Testament. So when, uh, by alluding to Isaiah 24, 23 in uh, Matthew 25, 31, he sets it up that this is, Jesus is coming to take over the world as its rightful Messiah, and he's going to decide who gets to take part in this kingdom. The very same thing that we've been talking about, the, the judgment that determines who is worthy of a place in the new world that comes when Jesus comes again. And he's basically saying, if you were heartless and cruel uh, to your fellow human beings, you're going to end up going off where the devil and his angels go. So that connects, right, to the eternal fire that uh, the de- that is determined, uh, the reserved for the devil and his uh, angels. That connects directly to Isaiah 24, verses 21 and 22, where the kings of the earth and presumably all human beings uh, unworthy human beings, and the host of heaven on high are tossed into the same imprisonment. Okay, um, and, and I think there's more to draw out there. Um, one thing that I that I, w- I had thought of that I, I think we could draw out a little bit more is in reference to the second chance and the resurrection of the unjust and the unrepentant, um, you're mm-hmm. saying that there's there's a period of time where God has given them a chance to make peace with him and to grasp hold of eternal life through Jesus Christ and have forgiveness. Um, it, it, it seems like you're saying this would happen before the deception of the nations where the devil and his angels are loosed, or is it after? It's all one moment. You know, we're not given a, a detailed picture here. Okay. All, I mean, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have come to the point of view that we're talking about an actual real offer until I became fully aware that Isaiah 27, 1 to 5, is talking about the same thing as the confrontation in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. Yeah. If that, it, that is God's perspective on it. And you can also read Isaiah uh, 57, 15 to 21, which I believe speaks about the same thing, but slightly more indirectly. Okay. Um, okay, so um, now th- that would lead me to kind of the next the next point of the question that I've got is, I think that I had read in your book that you believe they will have a second chance, the unrepentant will have a second chance to accept Christ, to make peace with Christ, and to have forgiveness uh, and enter into eternity and fellowship with Christ, but you, you don't believe they will. Is, is that correct? True. Okay. Yeah. I don't think they'll take it. I don't think I'm showing, I don't think there's any indication in the text that gives me hope, especially when I read Isaiah 57, 15 to 21. And, uh, because it basically says there is no peace. I mean, let me just quote it from memory, right? Uh, Isaiah, uh, God, once again, it's God talking about the final perdition of the of those who are going to be lost, right? If you get, yeah, go to uh, verses 9, 8, 18 to 21 or so. Um, when, he's, when God himself is talking about the perdition of those who ultimately will be lost, he says, peace, peace to those who are far and to those who are near, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea that cannot rest. It keeps tossing up mud and mire. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So in other words, peace, peace. You see that double peace? That is unique in the covers between uh, between Genesis and Revelation. That is a unique phrase. God appealing to those whom he knows are not going to respond. Uh, but he does it anyway. Why? Because he's their creator and it's his choice to give them every opportunity to make peace with him before he destroys them. Okay. Um, so you, there's, there's a couple of things here. One, this seems like it would be an argument that would work for uh, universalism. And you're, you're taking the position that there is a universal resurrection as it's related to the universal atonement of Christ. 
Um, and maybe we'll be, we'll be able to get into the atonement and draw a little bit more of that aspect of it out. Because I, I believe in a universal resurrection, and I, I believe it's contingent on the work of Christ, the grace of, of Christ and God. I think these are, these are things that need to be connected and drawn out as it's related to the atonement. But, um, but the second chance part, I just, I'm struggling with that. Um, I, I think that the universalist would just have to, the, uh, just have to show that there is there's a universal resurrection. They're given a second chance, but but that they would have a good reason mm-hmm. to believe that that they could actually repent and turn to Christ and seek peace and forgiveness. But um, but as it's related to the devil and his angels, you're saying that they would have a second chance as well, but that yeah. they rejected. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a popular Christian belief about the devil. Mm-hmm. and angels that somehow they are set in their ways and they can't repent and all this kind of stuff. That's just popular stuff. It's not based on anything in Scripture at all. Unless okay. you want to pull something up to tell them. So, so you think that the, the devil and his angels who have fallen and rebelled with the devil against God, um, that they, they have a chance... Okay, they have a chance now to seek forgiveness and repentance with, with God. Um, and they will... At the at this particular judgment as well, is that right? I imagine. Let me put it this way: any created being who, at any time, and I'm talking generically. I'm not just talking about human beings, mm-hmm. human, angelic, or any other kind of species of God's creation that turns from their wicked ways will be received by God. That is the gracious mm-hmm. God that we serve. Yeah. Those who turn from their wicked ways will live. And uh, I'm given no information in the scripture that tells me, well, the angels can't repent and stuff. That's something somebody made up. I don't know why they did that. Um, okay, so I don't know if you had a chance to watch uh, the Sam Shamoon, uh, Doug Wilson debate the other day. But this is something nope. that, it, it was on limited atonement. But this is something that, that, that Doug really kind of hammered him on. It was it was on the nature of judgment towards the angels and the unrepentant angels and those uh, those who have rejected Christ in in this life, but specifically re, re, uh, dealing with the angelic world um, and the devil and his angels. Sam took the position that the atonement of Christ and the blood of Christ was able to bring forgiveness and uh, reconciliation to the angelic world, including the devil, but that they would, they would reject it, they would never accept it, but that it was, it, it actually covered even sin and iniquity of the angelic world up to that point. Do you have a position on that as well? I might look at things generally the same as that. As I said, Christ's uh, death, according to Colossians, dealt with Every cosmic problem that there is, yeah, heaven and things on earth. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised at all to find when we come to glory that there are angels who had been not in right relationship with God, that who through Christ came to repentance and came into reconciliation with God. I don't know. We're, the thing is, angels are intentionally in this age behind the scenes. We're not told much about God's interactions with them. And people supply way too much stuff from their own death. But I can just say as a general principle, theologically speaking, God is the kind of God who, if you turn from your wicked ways, he will receive you uh, with open arms. Yeah. Isaiah 55 uh, is a key text for that. Okay, um, now this is a side note, but I think it's going to tie into the resurrection. What's your stance and position on the deity of Christ? Are you Trinitarian? Roughly Trinitarian. I mean, I do not absolutize the philosophical thinking of Greek guys, you know, three and four centuries after Jesus. Uh, They're doing their best, and I respect them for that, and I believe in the full deity of christ and i believe in the full humanity of christ yeah uh 
but you know, you know, homo Luciano and all this kind of stuff, that's the formula to me. That's not like you have to believe that or else you're a heretic or something. Um, okay, so do you believe that Jesus, um, that, that not, the, not the human side of Jesus, pri- uh, dealing with the incarnation, prior to the incarnation, where was the son? Where, well, how would you answer He was that? On, sitting on the throne of the universe with his father. He, Jesus, was the designer and the plan of the entire creation. He himself is the architectural plan of the entire creation, not just us. Yeah. Every single thing that exists, exists because it reflects the wisdom that is in him that flows from the Father through him and into the physical and every other kind of structure of this creation. I forgot what a- question I'm answering, but he is the rightful uh, king of the universe. And so he was king of the universe before he was incarnate. He uh, came down here and served. He, our king came and visited us and served us on his knees, washing our feet, healing us, and uh, freeing us from the devil and so on and so forth, and dying for us. And when he was done with that, he was raised by the power of the Spirit, and now sits on the throne of the universe again, as he was before. Now, you said that he's the designer and the plan. He's the architect and the plan. Do you see those as two different people, or do you see that as uh, the, the designer and the architect kind of generating the plan and manifesting through the plan? I don't know exactly how to answer that. No, he's not two people. I'm saying that Christ, the Logos, before yeah. he ever had a human body, he himself, in himself, the Logos, is the wisdom to give every single thing in the creation its shape and its way of being. That is him. Uh, he is the pattern. He himself is the pattern. He's not just the, we don't just, I don't just think of him as the dude that's thinking and designing something external to himself. If you, anywhere you look in the creation, you see the wisdom of Christ manifesting itself. You see, in a, in a sense, you see Christ, the Logos, who gives everything its way of being. Um, okay, so I know that we're getting off. Uh, we're getting off here. Um, this is this is an interesting side of the conversation too. So okay, because um, it's related to the atonement, and it, which is going to be related to the resurrection, which is related to the new creation. So mm-hmm. as, as it's related to the identity of who this Jesus is and his pre-existence to the incarnation, do you believe that the Father? and the Son and the Holy Spirit are, are separate persons, but one being? Well, roughly. I mean, that is human, that's human language, you know, human thought. Uh, that's as close as you're going to get to try to describe it. I'm not a, you know, oneness type person or something. I am not a modalist. I am not a Sabarianist. Yeah. Uh, I'm much closer to, uh, or, you know, roughly a Trinitarian, but I'm just saying I do not absolutize the thinking of Greek dudes three <laughs> centuries after Christ. I'm, I'm working from Scripture, not from going to theologize out of the Greek philosophical basis. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that's where a lot of the argument would go back to, is it, is it a Platonic theory? philosophy and the origin of of the trinity which i i think is something that can be debunked but it but okay so let's let's see how this is related to the atonement i it seems like you draw a connection that is very similar to scott smith scott smith and i did um we did a three or yeah. four part series on what he what a term that he came up with with which is a pananastasism and it's related to the resurrection, the universal resurrection, as it's related to the atonement. Now, you 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 had emailed me prior to um, prior to us discussing kind of what this podcast would look like, and you said, well, that you you agreed with a lot of what Scott was saying, but how, where exactly would you um, start in in the, the conversation of the atonement as it's related to the resurrection, 
and then we'll see where we can go from there. I know we're at an hour and 45 minutes right now, but how, how would you start with that? Is that something that's, that's valuable as we discuss the, the resurrection? Well, you know, because it's a theory about the book of Revelation, I can just go to Revelation 1, verse 18, where Jesus says, I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. And behold, I have the keys of death and Hades. What are you saying? Uh, thanks to his death on behalf of all, uh, he has the authority from God to release every human being from death, or even the unrepentant who are in Hades, right? In the prison of Hades. Yeah. And in, in that sense, he redeems, he is their redeemer. He gives them a parole from the sentence of death that all human beings Adam. And in that sense, his death is effectual uh, to release them from the curse of death. Yeah. And there's a lot of similar stuff like Romans chapter 5, uh, right? Uh, maybe 1 Corinthians 15. And there's a bunch of atonement passages. Uh, we have a list of them somewhere in my in my slideshow here that clearly indicate that Christ died on behalf of all, and what He achieved for all is to give them the opportunity to take part in the new creation after their death. Yeah. And uh, what they do with that is what that's the judgment, right? In uh, in John five, it says, you know. Those who've done the evil deeds will come out to a resurrection of judgment. They don't just come out so that God can uh, do things to them. They come out in order to give them an opportunity to take part in God's new world. And how they, what they do with that opportunity is the judgment. It's like a new temptation in the final Eden. Eden, sorry. All right, the devil's there, and he's saying to him, you know, don't believe God. Uh, you know, just follow me and we'll be able to take over this joint. And uh, when they believe the devil, they basically finally judge themselves unworthy of life. And they are consumed by fire. And yeah. so is the devil. Okay, so I've got a couple of things there. Um, as, as it's related to that judgment and resurrection and judgment again, I, it seems like to me it would be somewhat contradictory to say that it's appointed unto man to live once and after this the judgment um, when we're taking the position that they'll live twice and be judged twice. So it, it seems like they're, they're, they live once, they die, they're judged um, in Hades through the millennium, then they're resurrected back to life. They, they have the chance to accept, accept um Christ, they had the chance to make peace and have forgiveness, but but they won't. So they're going to be judged again and ultimately uh, cast into the lake of fire where they're going to, where they're going to perish. So um, it, I, can you can you kind of explain how you would see that as as not being contradictory that that um, that they'll live once and have a judgment, but they'll actually live twice and have two judgments? I have to go. Okay. Uh, you remember I mentioned that I might have to leave, so I'll be back in yep. four minutes or so. All right, copy that. Well, I'm going to keep that muted there, put the screen back on to me, guys. I think there's a, he does have a lot of good arguments. He's, got a, he's brought up a lot of good points. I think a lot of the stuff that um, we agree with is going to be related to the atonement. Some problems that I see us running into right at the start is going to be um, the nature of the bodies of those who enter into uh, the millennial reign of Christ. So he would see it as a glorified body. This would be the first point of contention that I would have to, to prove um, the argument against uh, pre-tribulation um, versus post-tribulation rapture. He's taken, he's taken the position that at the judgment of prior to the judgment of nations, uh, those who meet the Lord in the air are those who... Um, are those who take part in the resurrection and enter into the kingdom in, in that resurrected glorified body. 
And I would take the position that those who are entering into the kingdom um, are those who have come out of the tribulation at the judgment of the nations and have, have sided with Christ not to have the glorified body, but the bodies that they're in. They, I mean, it, it just seems contradict. I think there's a lot that could be drawn out there. That'd be the first point of contention that I would have. The second point of contention that I would have is, is going to be, obviously, the nature of the resurrected body of the unjust, the reprobate, the heretic, those who have rejected Christ in this life. Um, he, he's taken the position that they're going to have a body that's not going to be like the body of Christ, that it, it, it's, it, it's designed to live forever. I would take the position, in a hard position, I think, like Scott Smith, that the resurrected body is the body that was purchased by Christ through the atonement to be like the body of, of the resurrected body of Christ, which is designed to live forever. So that, that in turn is going to go into our argument for um, annihilationism. If they've got a body that's designed to live forever and they're cast into the lake of fire where their torment goes on forever and ever, along with the smoke of their torment that goes on forever and ever, um, I think that you'll see um, that even in Matthew 25 where it's talking about the, the nature of the resurrected body being like those of the angels. Um, so we're looking at immortality, we're looking at annihilationism, we're looking at the nature of the resurrection for both the just, the unjust, the unrepentant, and the repentant. So to me, those would be some of the main points of contention that, that I would have is, is one going to be pre-trib versus post-trib rapture, Two is going to be who enters into the millennial kingdom. Is it physical bodies? Is it resurrected bodies? Uh, what is it? And uh, three is going to be when you get to the the end of the millennium and you've got the devil and his angels that are loosed for a short season and they go to deceive the nations and you've got a battle of Gog and Magog, essentially what you've got here is uh, the resurrection of the unjust uh, alongside the devil and his angels who seek to uh, make war against the, the righteous nations of God. It just doesn't make any sense to me. When you get to that point, it's like, well, they're given an opportunity to repent and to, and to turn to God, but they're deceiving the nations. They're doing all these things alongside the devil and his angels, and therefore they're going to be annihilated. But how I see it is if they're deceiving the nations, you've got people who are in actual bodies like our bodies, um, that that are that are being deceived. So when you've got the battle of Gog and Magog, it's not just like a, a bunch of immortal bodies that are going to battle against uh, mortal bodies of resurrected mortal bodies. There's just a lot going on here, um, and I see that Webb is back, so I'm going to put him back on the screen and unmute him. So, but anyway, so I was kind of going good. over a number of um, the areas of contention that we've got, but I think. I, we've been going for an hour and 53 minutes, but I, we're, we were we were coming to um, we were coming to the nature of the atonement as it's related to the resurrected body of the unrepentant, and it, it seems like you're saying that the the nature of that body is is going to continue to be mortal um, because it it doesn't take on immortality the immortality of, of of Christ even though it is the grace of God that that's resurrecting them so. Um, I think that'd be a, a something that we could draw. I, I'd like to see more work on the resurrection of the just versus the unjust. The way that I see it is the resurrection of the unrepentant is going to be is going to be in an immortal body based off of the resur the resurrection and atonement of Christ. But um, that would obviously need to be drawn out more. So. Okay. Um, so I'll just say. I believe it's a misreading of 1 Corinthians 15 to uh, apply to those who are Christ, right, these things uh, that he says. I mean, in general, let me put it this way. In general, chapter 15 is about the resurrection of the faithful. That's the question. Or, I mean, that's the issue that he is called to write about. People are saying, we don't need a resurrection. We're going to go off to heaven. And we're going to be, you know, some kind of Greek, uh, you know, sort of proto-Gnostic notions of that, that uh, spiritual being is better than physical. So he writes this whole chapter to debunk that idea. 
And he says, look, if, if the resurrection is not physical, we are charlatans and you are screwed. Kind of. But anyway, so in almost the entire chapter, with the exception of his very brief and uh, kind of, let's just say, uh, cryptic or, you know, all he says about those who are not Christ, he says, the end comes. He never actually refers to the resurrection uh, of anyone else besides the faithful in, in chapter 15, because first of all, in one, for two reasons. One, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about Christians, whether they're going to be brought back as bodily people or not. And in, in the second case, uh, is the resurrection bodily? And I've forgotten what the next thing was. But so, in other words, the entire chapter is all about us, 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 and so on and so forth. To, to, and he never actually refers directly to the resurrection of the unrepentant. All he says is, after, you know, everyone will be resurrected in their own, own cohort, and then comes the end. And then he skips on to carry on with what he really wants to talk to about, right? Uh, so when he says, for example... Down in uh, verses kind of forty-ish, right? Or yeah, the body celestial the versus terrestrial. Right, verse forty-two. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable; it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor; it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness; it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body; it is raised a spiritual body. So. Yeah. The focus there is on uh, believers. Unbelievers mm -hmm. are not going to have an imperishable, have a glorified body. They're going to be given the ability to stand on their feet again on this earth. And between you and me, in principle, there's no such thing. God does not create things that are literally indestructible by him. You know, God can't create a rock uh, too heavy to, for God to lift. So if God gives you a body... Um, there, there's no such thing as God giving people a body that is literally indestructible in the sense that even God can't get rid of it. If you conduct yourself in the creation in a way that is stubbornly contrary to the well-being of your fellow created beings, God has the right and the power to remove you from the creation. It doesn't matter if you've been uh, raised in a resurrected body uh, and so I'm not, we're not told what kind of bodies they have. We know that uh, we're told, or, you know, the implication is they have bodily resurrection. We're not told that they're being made uh, in, incorruptible in, and immortal. They're still, I mean, it turns out if you read Revelation 7, 27, 10, and you understand that that is being, referring to the resurrection of the wicked, I mean, those guys are sinners still. God is not going to allow sinners to have their way forever. He's going to remove them by incineration uh, before they can do any harm to his faithfulness. Now, that is the story that you get in Isaiah, yeah. and uh, Isaiah 26, Isaiah 66, a bunch of Jesus' Gehenna, Gehenna uh, sayings like, beware of him who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Uh, Gehenna is, if you look carefully, you'll find out that when he talks about Gehenna, that's shorthand for a reference to Isaiah 66, verses 22 to 24. Because if he then, in Mark 9, he says, Gehenna, where their fire is not quenched and the worm, worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So when he talks about Gehenna, he's talking about the final demon, uh, resurrected unrepentant when they attempt to lay siege to the people of God in the new creation. Okay. So I think this would be a good place, uh, well, it, it, kind of a response that I would have in 1 Corinthians 15. I think that 1 Corinthians 15 is kind of the key to understanding the nature of the resurrection for both both the unrepentant and the repentant, the faithful and the unfaithful, as it's related to their resurrected bodies. And the reason I say that is, I know you were saying you don't think that it's actually addressing um, the unrepentant. It's only a reference to Christians. Um, but I, I think I think that's where First Corinthians 15 needs a little more work done on it. I think this is an area that I've looked at that I 
I think uh, really causes a lot of trouble for those who had taken an annihilationist position um, because you're you're talking about the nature of the resurrected body for the unjust. So when I see in verse uh, 34 and 35, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak to this your shame. And he's he's automatically uh, showing a distinction of, of categories. You, you've got an awaking to righteousness for Christians, and you've got some who have never even had the knowledge of God. So if it, you, you can't have Christians who have never had any knowledge of God, um, but you've got some who are awaking to righteousness. I don't think that we would make the argument that that the unrepentant are awakening to righteousness, but I also don't think we would be make, taking the position that those who are awakening to righteousness have no knowledge of God. Um, so I, I think that I we've got to... your argument, though. You what? Verse 33 says, verse 33, I don't understand your argument. Verse 33 in, you know, NIV says, don't be misled, bad company corrupt, corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Who are the ones who are ignorant of God? The people who are selling you this BS that you don't that that God has no plan to resurrect you, but that you're going to go flying off as a spirit into into the ether someplace. That's who he's talking about. It's not I, how how does that tell us anything about the resurrection of the unrepentant? Well, what I was getting at is in the reference in verse 35 where he says, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body will they come? Now, the reference to the dead is, is it, to me, the way that I see it is not a reference to just Christians that he's referencing here, but a reference of resurrection in general. And I, I know that we've got two categories of resurrection. So when he lumps the dead into one category, he's not, he's not differentiating between a resurrection of the just versus the unjust. And I think he goes in to kind of uh, differentiate the the nature of that resurrection when you get into terrestrial versus celestial and glory as it's related to glory and, and what was sown in the body is going to be reaped in the resurrected body. So if you've, if you've got a, a body that that is sown in corruption, that would be this body. One that's raised in incorruption, that's the body that's raised. Um, and, and specifically, I, I don't think that you, and I just think it needs more work. I don't think that it, it can be nailed down that this chapter is directed only at Christians and the nature of a resurrected body for uh, the faithful. I think there's been a, there has been um, some that's been written about it, and I, I, I can't remember who I was reading, but they went through 1 Corinthians 15 and showed that it, the biggest mistake that Christians make when we discuss 1 Corinthians 15 as it's related to the resurrection is saying that it's only about Christians. Um, and, and I think that's where it just needs a little more attention, a little more attention on my part as well to, to look at it and go, well, what is the nature of the resurrection for the unjust, the unrepentant? Because if they are given a body that's sown in incorruption, um, that's, that, differs, uh, that, that differs based on what it was, uh, the works that were done in the body in this life, but it is an incorruptible body, and it can yet see corruption. It can see destruction. It can see, it it can perish. But I would see that as being something that is a continual state of a body that is not going to be totally annihilated. So I think that would kind of be yeah. the, the route that I would go there. I I think you're trying to hold two things at the same time here. Uh, one, you're saying it's, it's incorruptible and glorious, but on the other hand, it's capable of being constantly destroyed. There's a contradiction in terms going on there. But in verse 35, when it says, "When but someone did raise, he is now caricaturing or characterizing what the false teachers are telling the Corinthians about their future hope. They're basically throwing people's understanding of what their experience, uh, their expectation of their future destiny is, they're throwing them into confusion because uh, they've got this Greek thinking that it's better not to have a body at all. And so this thing where he says, how are the dead raised and how, what kind of body do they come, right? He's saying there's people out there asking all these rhetorical questions that supposedly can't be answered, right? That prove that if you keep asking those sorts of questions, you'll end up uh, with their view. And Paul is saying, no, that's a, a foolish line of thinking. Let me explain it to you the way Jesus talks about, right? He says it's a seed 
uh, how does it go? You know, uh, Jesus and John, when the, when the Greeks come to him, uh, and he says, if a seed falls into the earth and dies, it, it remains alone, but, uh, but then it grows up and so on and so forth. So Paul is kind of using that kind of uh, terminology. He's saying that the, all right, he's saying for your hope is not that you're going to go off and not have a, a physical body anymore. Your hope is that you, in this mortal life, you're like a seed rel relative to the full, uh, fully mature human being, bodily human being that is coming. So there's a huge transformation that happens between the seed and the whole tree, for example, but they're both physical. They're the same in some important ways. The one is sown in a body, in a psychical body, or right, psychical. Uh, that means that you can actually survive without having a relationship with God and the Spirit. God has designed human life in this age so that people can actually get away with not having a relationship with God. But in the age to come, in the resurrection, your, life, your body will be fully invested with the life power of the Holy Spirit, and it will be glorious. I think that, uh, you know, you know, we can't go too far with this, but basically I think that starting with verse 35, just taking 35 and trying to build a whole, you know, conceptual scheme that everybody gets a glorified body, whether they're a Christian or not, just is down, that's a dead end path. Yeah, so um, I, I think that I was kind of skipping ahead there, and I'm not, I'm not saying that there isn't um, an unknown interlocutor here that's questioning and leading them into heresy, but what I am saying is, uh, the nature of the resurrection is 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 drawing back to one the nature of the body that we're in now to the nature of the body that's going to be resurrected, and I think it's compared and seen pretty easily in verse twenty one that um, death came by one man, and then resurrection, and and also the resurrection of the dead. And for an Adam all die, even so in, in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, so I think there's there's a general reference to a general resurrection here that it would include the resurrection of, of the unjust. And, and then I think he breaks the, the dialogue down and the conversation down as to the nature of that resurrection. And, and specifically, he's, he's, he's kind of making that mocking reference of those who say uh, in verse 32, if the dead rise not, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And he's talking about mm -hmm. awaking to righteousness. So he's he's showing some men think there is no resurrection. If 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 Christ didn't raise from the dead, then there would be no resurrection. But that's including both categories, both categories of the just and the unjust. And I think that you're even making the argument that the resurrection of the unjust is conditional upon the work of Christ on the cross specifically and his resurrection. So. Yeah. Um, I, I think there are two categories that are spoken about in 1 Corinthians 15. I just need to draw it out more and see um, how it's related to uh, the nature of that right. resurrection, to, to Christ's resurrection. Well, let me just, yeah, I think we need to get off this and onto something more interesting, but Christ uh, is the source of the resurrection of every person who will be resurrected, and that is every person who has ever lived, according yeah. to Paul. But Paul is very uh, reluctant to get into anything, saying anything specific about what happens to anyone other than the believer. And the, there's one really obvious reason, and that's because that's off topic. He was asked, are we going to be spirits off in heaven? You know, we thought you said you we're going to be resurrected. And these new apostles are telling us that uh, we're going to be spirits and resurrection is for... for uh, the resurrection thinking is for the, the uninitiated and so on and so forth. Well, he is hammering on that throughout the entire chapter and uh, trying to take one verse, like verse 33 or something, and then try to build that everybody, including the uh, unrepentant, ends up getting an indestructible body, but which is also destructible at the same time. And all that is just a mess. Yeah, I'm not saying it's That's indestructible. My, of repeating it, though. Um, and, and I'm not saying it's indestructible, but it is destructible. I'm saying it's it's um, unperishable. It's in, it's indestructible in the sense that 
it, it will never see final destruction or final um, a final stage of ceasing to exist, but that it will continually see destruction. It will continually be yeah. perishing. It'll, it, it will continually be corrupting um, because it's, it's, it's the nature of the resurrection of it's the It's incorruptible, body. though. Just see how you're contradicting yourself. You're saying it's incorruptible, but it will continuously be being corrupted. The problem here is that you're taking a reading of Revelation 20, verse 10, and Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, and you've got a certain way of reading those things, and that you're trying to make it uh, match what you're reading here in First Corinthians 15. So I don't blame you for trying to make this, read the scriptures concordantly with each other, but it, I believe you are mistaken about Revelation 14 and 20, and uh, you don't have to try so hard to make these things match up with each other. Yeah. Um, it, which I would just have to, I'd just respond and say, well, I'm not being as clear as I need to be because it, 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 it's like I'm, I'm, I'm being contradictory in what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that the nature of the body, and, and you get what I'm saying, I'm saying the nature of that resurrected body is, is going to go on forever and ever, just like the nature of the devil and his angels, where they're going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I think they're not literally going to be tormented forever and ever, according to my reading of Revelation 20, verse 10. Okay, so let that be a good place to end. Let's, um, we're at two hours and 11 minutes, 12 minutes now. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you give give an explanation for the nature of, um, the the devil and his angels in Revelation? Was it 2010, I think? Revelation 20. So this is, uh, going to take a little while but if you could go to slide what did i just say slide uh 24 um okay and i mean how many minutes do we have let's let's try to keep it in, in can you do it in five minutes i think so so okay. go to slide 24 so just type 24 enter and you go to slide 24 the top item is surely one has to take literally the 11 